A few months back I made a rather short video about looking for some alternatives to the Raspberry Pi. Unfortunately I hit a few bugs and also found out I'd have to work a lot more overtime and Saturdays at my day job, which had been bitten by the labor shortage bug. Good news though, I found some time and found my bugs and got Ninefront to boot on a MediaTek 7688. I started this project on looking through the alternative kernels for Plan 9. I came across an old one for a now out of production MicroTik router board. I did use a chip that was similar to the MediaTek chip uh, used in the Onion Omega 2. And unlike the Raspberry Pi Zero, I could buy the Onion Omega. Uh, both were a MIPS based chip, specifically MIPS 24KEC. Uh, an interesting thing about these MIPS chips is that they can be set to be either Big Indian or Little Indian by the manufacturer. And the Atheros chip in the Microtech board was Big Indian, while the MediaTek chip was Little Indian. Uh, Indian issues are a thing to watch out for, and I did end up finding a few. Plan 9's history does intersect with MIPS, and Plan 9 and 9 Front have compilers for both Big and Little Indian MIPS. Matter of fact, there's just one MIPS compiler, the B compiler, uh, the Zero compiler, assembler, and linker for Little Indian MIPS is just the Big Indian MIPS stuff with a Little Indian flag wrapped in a shell script. And from here on, I'll be distinguishing um, them as MIPS for Big Indian and SPIM for Little Indian. The original CPU server for Plan 9 at Bell Labs was a multiprocessor MIPS machine. Today the hype is around RISC-V, but back in the day it was MIPS. Basically the folks at Stanford looked across the street at the idea for RISC-1 over at Berkeley and ended up making MIPS. Uh, MIPS became the chips used by Silicon Graphics, and after the hype around the first Jurassic Park movie, it ended up being used in the PlayStation 2 and Nintendo 64, and Microsoft even did a port of Windows NT to MIPS workstations. So Plan 9 has had MIPS code in it since the very beginning. So my first attempt at writing a kernel for the 7688 was to start with the router board kernel and update it to run on 9front. Uh, this got me through the initial booting but would die with a vague error at the handoff to user space. After being away for so long I decided to start from scratch uh, but this time use a kernel from uh, Nine front that someone had written for the SGI Indie. Uh, previous experience made me think it would be easier to add router board code to the newer Plan 9 kernel than to put Indie code into the router board kernel. Uh, but I eventually found myself with the same problem. Uh, checking the output of what code was working, I found that the last little bit um, before the jump to user space um, was setting some environmental variables and they were not working. But it didn't seem to be my problem, since this early in the boot, anything that did want to uh, use these variables was using a function called gitconf rather than reading the env files. So I started adding prints into various parts of my code and the portable code to see what was happening, since I wasn't getting an actual error message. Uh, the thing I could get to print most reliably was dump stack. So I started adding that everywhere and I found that I was getting to user space um, loading this bit called a knit code here. It sits in the portable. So I could get this to start up, which is the next thing that happens after that init zero here. Um, but it would die on the first um, system call to open the console file here. So it would die right there. Now the SGI Indie code on 9Front had uh, also borrowed some of the code from that router board kernel. Um, both were MIPS rather than SPIM. But with a bit more digging, I found out that uh, David Du Columbier, uh, who does a lot of the um, work on the Legacy 9 project, had written a kernel for a couple um, Longson chips a while back. And those were SPIM chips. 
And sure enough, he left some comments in the system call code mentioning that the Indian difference does cause some sort of alignment issue. Uh, with that fixed, syscall worked, and now the issue was the environmental variables um, that I'd previously found. Um, the next part of the init code actually does some of that. Um, but again, I started having to add my own prints to see why the file system setup was failing. I soon found out that uh, when passing the strings of text around, they were getting garbled. Now, I had been having some weird issues with printing to the UART console the whole time, uh, but didn't think much of it as the notes left for the original router board had also complained of the low quality UARTs on these sort of chips. But I wasn't just getting strings garbled when going down the serial line. The strings were getting garbled in the code itself. And specifically, they were getting truncated rather... Uh, so rather than like slash env um, being entered, it would be just slash e or just a, a hash sign or whatever. So the function to find string lengths was busted and that led me to this bit of machine specific assembly. Since so few people have used the SPIM chips, this bit of code had never had a chance to be tested. Uh, the only SPIM code I did find was for those long sung chips, which are really fairly rare outside of China. Um, with that fixed, all these strings and init code worked, and then it was off to execute boot boot. Um, at this point, I also had to recompile all the SPIM code on my nine front file server because almost everything uses that string length function. Uh, the next issue after that was interrupt handling code. Uh, MIPS chips come with eight interrupts. Two of them are software interrupts that no one seems to use, and the other six are hardware. Um, the last of the eight um, was for the built-in counter. Uh, since these are universal among MIPS chips, I was able to borrow code to handle these interrupts, and it worked fine. Uh, at the most minimal, it had to work just to run other processes because the counter would cause... Um, a regular interrupt, which would be used to call the scheduler, which would make sure that other processes were ran. But this MediaTek chip comes with far more than just five pieces of hardware for the remaining built-in interrupts. So it has a second interrupt controller, and since no one had done a MediaTek interrupt controller for Plan 9, I was kind of on my own. So a lot of this was helped by NetBSD code, um, not only for other MediaTek-based routers, but MediaTek themselves had released a small system on a module like the Onion Omega called the Linkit Smart. Uh, so when I'd written the interrupt handling code a while back, I would hope it would work and found out, much to my surprise, that it half worked. I was expecting worse. But part of the issue was that I had like three different offsets going on, since no one seemed to use the first two interrupts, 0 and 1, most stuff treated interrupt 2 as interrupt 0, and then I also had to offset the secondary controller off that. So I fixed up my interrupt code, got the interrupt code for the UART to be called correctly, and now the whole boot process would run, except I wouldn't see anything after the initial text printed during the startup. And those messages were largely printed using a function that would just spam ASCII directly into the UART's transmit address. Uh, I could see, um, using a debug option in the MMU code, um, that would show every time there was a context switch happening and what processes it was switching to. And by printing right into the UART, I could see that every step of the boot script was being ran all the way to the spot where it called uh, DD while asking for how to proceed booting. But there'd just be no text. Uh, that all led to reading a lot of the code for UART and cons, and it does distinguish between printing from the kernel versus printing from user space. And I found that if I left some of the UART options nil, I could still default to calling the function that would spam text straight into the UART's transmit register. And here I am now. So let's boot 9front on the Onion Omega 2. Um, the Onion Omega does have USB and an SD card reader, um, but I don't have drivers for either of those yet. So no booting off the disk. Uh, 
Um, I also don't have network drivers done either. So for now I can use a feature on nine front, um, which is just to run RC. This is mostly used for disaster recovery. Uh, but part of building a kernel is to build a small file system and there's a proto file where you can pick which programs get added to it. So packfs has RC, so I can change directory. Um, I can ls. Uh, I can cat. Um, and that's about it for now. There's only a handful of programs in here. Um, and another thing as of right now is that I don't have um, I don't have floating point uh, working yet. Um, this chip doesn't come with a floating point unit. I do have some code that emulates one, but I haven't added it yet because it requires a change to uh, the tos.h file. Or at least it does on Ninefront. The legacy nine code still seems to have the uh, scratch space needed for the MIPS floating point emulator in the, uh, the top of stack uh, data structure. Uh, you can patch that in uh, to Ninefront yourself, but you have to be mindful about recompiling everything that might use it because it holds the data structures held at the top of the stack and there's a lot of stuff that you needs to know where and how big the stack is. For an Encore here, I'll show it booting on an actual router board. Um, this is the uh, Highlink HLK7688A. Um, you can purchase this as a whole board, including antenna and RJ45 ports, or just as a system on a module. Um, this one's nice because uh, they actually have a copy of um, U-Boot that comes with TFTP on it. So I can just fetch my files off the uh, Line front server here. So with the Onion Omega, I had to shuttle everything back and forth with the thumb drive all the time. And now we'll jump to. And there it goes. Same thing though, um, once it's booted up, it doesn't actually have access to the ethernet ports anymore because I don't have the drivers for that done. Um, but I can still just run whatever programs are on here. So my plan is to use the Onion Omegas for some sensors around the house and to get this little router board set up to be the endpoint for those and for my whiz light bulbs. Uh, it's best to keep those in a closed off network anyway since they have pretty much no security. Uh, and that'll mean writing the code for the built-in five port switch, which should be interesting. Cisco had some plan nine based routers, but they never uh, released the source code. So I'll be on my own for that. Um, if things calm down at work, then uh, 2022 may end up being the year of nine front on the router. And until then, have fun.